So our sister that's going to come forward, and I want us to think about this. She is the national spokesperson for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Many of us have read about people in the past, and you've read the autobiography of Malcolm X and read about that, right? But you know what? He was the national spokesperson for the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad at a time. Is that right? You've heard and read about the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was amongst us, he was the spokesperson for him. Is that right? So our sister comes in the same line of being the spokesperson of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and said another way, the spokesperson, national spokesperson of the Jesus and our midst. In the nation of Islam, we have a constitution because we're not the church of Islam. We're not the group of Islam. We're not the organization of Islam. We are the nation of Islam because we're going for self. We're not trying to ask nobody else to give us anything. Is that right? So we have a constitution and our sister helped put that constitution together and in it it mentions that a woman can rise in Islam to her highest God-given abilities. So our sister's known all over the planet, been featured in publications, is an author, has been an essence in so many other places, but I'll tell you, we are so honored to have her here today, the national spokesperson for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Let us give our sister a round of applause, a speaker of truth, bold and passionate and goes all over the country and other countries to speak on behalf of this great truth. Let us give our sister a round of applause. Sister, Dr. Student Minister Ava Muhammad, assalamu alaikum. Give it up for our sister, she makes her way up. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all so much. You may be seated. Thank you. In the most holy name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, we give praise and thanks to Allah for his love and mercy upon humanity, always when we go astray, raising up from among us prophets and messengers through whom he expresses his will, that he may guide us back into his favor and that we may be spared his judgment. There are many prophets and messengers as this holy Quran tells us we don't even know who they are. There have been so many. Because Allah gives every people its own messenger from among that people. But there are some whose names are given to us, particularly in this last 6,000 year cycle of history. And we thank Allah for them. We thank him for Moses with the Torah, Abraham. We thank him for Jesus with the gospel. We thank him for Muhammad ibn Abdullah, to whom was revealed the Holy Quran. Standing here in North America, where my people have been subjugated and held in bondage and subjected to the worst treatment in the annals of human history, I stand here humbly and I thank Allah for coming to us in the person of Master Farid Muhammad, July 4th, 1930, who came from Mecca in Saudi Arabia alone to seek and to save that which was lost. And he came upon a young man in the section of Detroit known as Black Bottom. That young man, Elijah Poole, was one of the six million black people who between 1915 and 1970 left the domestic terrorism of the South and came North seeking not only a better life, but life, period. And he met this young man, Elijah Poole, and spent three and a half years with him. During the time Master Farid Muhammad was in Detroit, Michigan, those three and a half years, he brought 25,000 black people, descendants very recently of slaves, many 
who had been in bondage were still alive. And he brought them back into the knowledge of their own self and kind. They were rid of the slave names of their master and given their original names. Among those names he gave was his own, Muhammad, one worthy of praise. And that young man you and I now know to be, because he is known all over this planet, the most courageous, brave black man to ever live. And we now know him to be, if you would read carefully and match your Bible to today's revelation and manifestation and fulfillment of prophecy. Yes. He is the one written of the promised Messiah. Messiah means liberator. Yes. It's not a spooky word. Yes. The predicted Christ, one with the power to crystallize us into oneness with God. Yes. That man, the most honorable, Elijah Muhammad is represented to us today by a man who is a living example of the embodiment of what one can do when one is free, justified, and made equal with man and mankind. We are thankful for the presence in our midst of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And as his student and follower, I greet all of my beloved brothers and sisters in the words of peace, I salam alaikum. Thank you so much, beloved. It is a great honor for me and my husband, Brother Darius Muhammad, to be back in Charlotte. We always love coming to this area and on behalf of Minister Farrakhan and the Executive Council, thank you for your work here in the South, representing the true word of God. And I want to thank each and every visitor and guest who took time from their Sunday to come out and spend it here. And I will not allow willing waste your time and I promise you not to take up a lot of your time. But I do have some things I would like to share and I hope they will be of value to you. And as student minister Sabir Muhammad, who is such a powerful speaker and such a strong example of that Joshua generation, we have finally at last produced a generation which is completely disconnected from the slave master as their God. They have rejected him entirely. Now why is that important? Because we could never be saved as long as we indulge in the one unforgivable sin. Allah says in the Holy Quran, and Allah says whether you know him as Christ, Jehovah, Lord, everywhere he speaks, he denounces idol worship. Yes. He denounces the practice of taking other gods besides him. Yes. And in the Holy Quran, the one unforgivable sin that we must abandon immediately when knowledge comes to us is the practice of taking gods besides God. Yes. You and I owe submission and complete worship to no one yes. except our creator. Yes. Even our beloved parents, we owe them honor, we owe them respect, but they are not the source of life. They are the agents through whom we were given life. But Allah says to us in this book, Holy Quran, he raises this question, how can you deny Allah when you were without life and he gave you life? And so to bow down to any man or any kind of a man, 
is to indulge in the unforgivable sin. The white man is not God. He is not the creator. He is a God, however. Ooh, don't leave me, work with me. God just means force and power. God is an attribute of Allah. The term God doesn't even have the capacity to express who Allah is. That's just one of his attributes. How can you say because you have force and power that you're the supreme being? A lion has force and power in his territory. It's an awesome attribute, but it doesn't make you the supreme being. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad stated that of Allah's 99 attributes, they have a theological order. They're not just all over the place. They came in an order. His first attribute is creator. Creator. He desired to be. And so in the triple darkness of space, he willed himself into existence in the cold, dark space from a single atom. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that after that battle, what came out of that darkness was a warrior. Because he had to fight into existence. And that's what you and I are going to have to do today. Brother Sabir said to you and I, on behalf of the youth, they cannot follow those who want to submit to one who is not the creator. Yes. And so with their help, with the help of the Caucasian people, our youth are free. Why do I say with their help? because they took everything from them. No education, no opportunity, no acceptance. To be 15, 16, 14, 18, you go in a store and you're followed around. You can't walk a block without being stopped and questioned, what are you doing here? Why do you have that hood? You can't even wear what you desire to wear. Because to a psychotic sociopath, you look dangerous. So unlike the so-called Negro, house, handkerchief head, spineless, cowardly ones, who are willing to sell our lives for a house and a car and a chair next to some white politician. In the Bible, they're called the enchanters. They're the ones that come out and say, go out and vote. We've been voting for 50 years. It was against the law prior to that. We died to get the vote. We put a black man in the Oval Office, which was inconceivable. Now you tell us, what do we get for that? So you keep telling us to vote, but you never show us what we get for the vote because you're an enchanter. And if you go in the Bible and the Holy Quran, what did Pharaoh promise the enchanters for selling out the children of Israel? Pharaoh promised them nearness to me. That was his promise. So we're at the Democratic Convention and we're in nigga heaven. <laughs> because we have nearness to Pharaoh. It can't fly anymore. It's over. It's over. We need to deal with it or die. Because judgment is coming on America whether we like it or not. I don't remember God taking votes. I don't remember him making committee chairs. 
All I know is in the book of Genesis, he told Abraham that his seed would be in a sojourn. They would undergo a sojourn or a journey into a land that was not theirs among a strange people. And they would serve those people for 400 years. That's us. That's what Brother Minister just told us. But he said after that time, who did he say was coming? I will come. So we don't need to get nervous when we say he came in the person of a man. And I will judge that nation which they shall serve and I will deliver them with great substance. But I want to uh, thank the laborers and believers. I want to thank uh, Brother Secretary Kaz. I don't know if I should thank him because he gave me the title of today's lecture, America. That's the biggest title I've ever been presented with in, in teaching for over 30 years. So this may end up being part one. <laughs> As I told Brother Student Minister Corey, I'm suffering from information overload. I just came from San Diego and a Native American sister gave me a book called The Black Indian. And I was reading that book yesterday and I was so overwhelmed. And I, you're looking at a history major. My undergraduate degree was in history. And my grandmother on my father's side was a Blackfoot Indian from Aniana, Alabama, and I knew her. Now, so you, I say that to say you think you know everything, okay? And I'm like, yeah, I know some of us have so-called Indian blood and they have so-called black blood, but if, oh my God, we have got to get a deeper understanding of how Satan has divided the original people yes. from each other and the tactics that he has used, and yet it has failed. Because we are uniting all of the original people of the earth, the black, the brown, the red, yes. are the original people. So terms like Mexican and Puerto Rican and Jamaican and Haitian, these are all labels that the European put upon us to divide us. But I just want to say thank you. This has been uh, Secretary Kaz, Brother Captain James Muhammad, Sister Captain Carrie X, Sister Deatrix, our protocol director, uh, all of you, and of course the believers, and I'm so glad it's cool in here. That is, that's great. But I'm not, I'm not gonna get so relaxed that I put you to sleep, inshallah. Now, very quickly, America. America is first and foremost an idea. It's an idea and an attitude. And that idea and attitude preceded the geographical uh, boundaries of America. And keep in mind that the Caucasian inhabitants of North America call themselves Americans. But in truth, this whole continent is America. We are in the northern part of it. But if you are from Central or South America, you're also an American. It's, and that's a name taken from a Spanish explorer who was over here before Columbus. And before he came, the black man and woman had been here. Okay, we were here, I, I don't wanna go down that road because it's a Sunday. Um, and, and you have to lay a base for some of this information. <laughs> But, beloved, we haven't been here thousands of years on this planet. We have not been here millions of years. We have been on this earth for trillions, 
trillions of years. And those of us who are worshipers of white people, because some of us are, let's just be real. And even those of us who say we aren't anymore are still attached. Okay, have, we have some sort of emotional attachment. Um, I was in the Fiji Islands looking for Starbucks. Okay. See, the minister gave us a course of study called self-improvement, the basis for community development. You can't develop a community unless every individual in that community is engaged in self-mastery. And think about that. If we were, would cease judging each other and do what Michael Jackson said, look at the man or woman in the mirror, wouldn't life be splendid? So looking at myself, I have to admit there are attachments that have to be cut. Yes. Mm. Yes. That umbilical cord. But praise be to Allah, we have produced that generation now. Brother Sabir quoted the minister so correctly and on time. The Joshua generation is fearless, but they are not wise. So there has to be the coming together of the wisdom of the elders, because we know this enemy. <laughs> and we also know about maneuvering through this minefield called America. Minister Farrakhan said, if you are black and you live in white America, you're a genius. So you can shed today any feelings of less than based on what credentials you've obtained from their educational institution. Because I went all the way through and got their law degree and never heard of this book, Holy Quran, until I heard Minister Louis Farrakhan. Now how do you not hear of a book that is the most widely read book on the earth. No, the Bible is the most widely read. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. See, we gotta, we gotta pay. We can't keep walking around capturing the gist of what is being said. I said the most widely read. The Bible is the most widely sold. Huge abyss between selling and buying and reading, okay? But this place called America is a place where the Caucasian people, when they came up out of the caves of Europe, having been exposed to civilization by Musa, who you know as Moses, whose name is mentioned in the Holy Quran more than anybody. Mm -hmm. Moses. And why is there such focus on Moses in the Bible and in the Holy Quran? Because those books are about you and I. They are prophecies of you and I. And Moses is the prototype of a deliverer. Because that is what we are in need of a deliverer, and I'm so happy to say we have one. But I wanted to talk to you this morning, this is probably going to end up being the introduction to the series of America, because I just want to briefly, beloved, uh, share with you what the perception of Caucasian people really is. And I thank Allah that Donald Trump has made it to achieve the nomination of the Republican Party because the longer he remains in front of you and draws out those of like mind, perhaps it will awaken those of us who are still in a coma 
under the drug of integration. Because integration is and always has been an illusion and a sin. Okay? And to student minister Corey's point, I'm so glad about women in Islam. Number one, don't confuse Islam the faith with underdeveloped men in an Arab and some African societies, culture. Any more than the Ku Klux Klan is Christianity. I don't have to answer for someone who's mentally imbalanced unless you're going to answer for all those who call themselves Christians and lynched black men and women in front of thousands of white people for entertainment. When you explain them, I'll explain so-called radical Islamist. These are names they make up, by the way. There's no such thing as a radical Muslim. Either you're a Muslim or you're not. We are not radical. We are seekers and lovers of peace. We're only radical in the sense that radical emanates from a root word meaning the root of. But no Muslim would ever harm an innocent person. This book, this is our holy book. We are instructed by Allah who revealed, this is not a third person book, this is direct revelation. These are not the, the interpretations and versions of a pretender to a British throne, King James. Now, in this book, Allah says he hates the aggressor. And he prohibits us from aggressing anyone. Yes. Well, then why are white people so afraid of it? Because it also says, fight with those who fight with you. Yes. Deeper still it reads, there is life for you in retaliation. See, when you gun my child down in the street, Carrying a picket sign is not justice. I'm not condemning protesters. I'm saying you're not going to achieve justice that way. Because the sign of justice is the scales in balance. So when you take my child's life at a minimum, I need to see you be held accountable for that. Not give me a check for $5 million, 3000 a month. That's what Laquan McDonald's mother is getting in Chicago. $2,700 a month off of two thirds of a five, because the lawyers got a third. So what was left of $5 million, you can go in the New York Times and see a painting that's $5 million. They shot her son 16 times in his back, doing no harm to anyone. The worst harm he was doing was to some tires on a car. And by the way, that's what the police are in your neighborhood for, to protect the property. Okay? Not you and I. Okay? But you and I have got to see us through their eyes. And then we will stop going down the wrong road. You and I are the only people on earth that a predator or an intruder can come in among us and kill one of us and we stand by and watch and they walk away. That's why we're called the lost sheep. Because sheep are the only animal that you can do that to. A wolf can walk right in among a herd of sheep, grab a lamb, and not only kill it, but sit there and eat the lamb. That's our youth, the lambs. 
Jesus, the Lamb of God. Yeah. Our babies are being eaten and our husbands, our wives, our sisters, our daughters. Okay. But quickly, the woman. Here's white people saying, oh, in Islamic countries, they don't treat their women right. Oh my God. How stunning the hypocrisy. Yes. When did women get the vote in America? Was it in the 1920s? There have been nine Muslim nations who have elected a woman president or prime minister of their country. Did you know that? The United States has yet to have one. And it looks like the one they may have has some serious issues with truth. The first black one was seven and a half years ago. But their idea of mistreatment because a Muslim couple whose son sacrificed his life in Iraq, it was either Iraq or Afghanistan several years ago, and they spoke at the Democratic Convention to Donald Trump, who is seeking to ban all Muslims from anywhere from coming into the United States for no other reason, reason than that you are a Muslim. Yeah. And they are from Iran, and their son was in the U.S. military and threw himself on a bomb and saved his uh, soldiers, his fellow soldiers. And they are making the point that according to the laws that you want to bring in, we wouldn't even have been allowed to come in. Now this is similar to what black soldiers have been going through since Crispus Attucks was the first to fall in the American Revolution. We have fought in every one of their wars. But when the husband and wife stood up and the husband spoke harshly and publicly to Donald Trump and said, what sacrifice have you made? My son gave his life and we gave him for this country. Donald Trump's response has been, why isn't the wife talking? Is it because she can't speak? Let me tell you real quick. A few years ago, my husband and I traveled to Saudi Arabia, to Mecca. Every Muslim is required to perform the pilgrimage or Umrah. Umrah is when you go at any time of the year you can. Pilgrimage is when all Muslims from around the world come together. Now, my husband and I were traveling to Egypt. We really had planned to just see the pyramids and other sites. And we went to see Minister Farrakhan to get his guidance on the climate at the time, this is in the 90s, and the travel, and you, you want to go with guidance. And he said to us, well, if you're going to be in, <laughs> in Egypt, you're going to be very close to Mecca. <laughs> so you should just go ahead and go to Mecca and do your Umrah. Well, when we attempted to get our visas, to get into Mecca, we, we had a letter from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan stating that we were Muslims and they would not recognize that letter. And so my husband said to them, this man is a head of state. They said, well, we love Minister Farrakhan, but we accept him, but he can't send anybody. So my husband said, oh, so you don't recognize the leader of the nation of Islam as a head of state. Let me tell you something, he told him. The day will come when you will make pilgrimage in the West, which is written. And this book, Holy Quran, condemns those who hinder men's ways from the mind. 
Christ. Now you see me standing here talking. You know I'm a student national spokesperson for the minister. I'm a lawyer by profession, all right? But when I am traveling with my husband, who is the authority in our household, and when my husband steps up and takes the point like a black man is supposed to take, I don't need to talk. It's not that I can't. Why should I? I don't have to. It's not my job. We have been led by this crazy white female into believing and confusing freedom and justice and equality for the woman with being a savage. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us it is the nature of the female to demand good treatment. She is the second self of Allah. His first act of creation after himself was to seek his own reflection of himself. Therefore, he had to reproduce himself. And you can't reproduce yourself with something less than yourself. So he went in his own mind, his own subconscious, and from himself he produced a second self called woman. Water seeks this level. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, don't call her a goddess. She's a God, brother, just like you. That's what he told the men. But we are allowing ourselves, male and female, we are the mothers and fathers of civilization. The black man is a God. He is the maker. He is the owner. He is the cream of the planet Earth. He is God of the universe. And one of the first requirements he must meet to hold that position is to protect, provide for, and respect and demand respect from all others for his woman. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to the black man, a message to the black man. Brother, I don't care what degrees you have. I don't care how much money you have. The whole world will make mockery of you if you do not respect your woman. Why? She is the vessel through which you reproduce yourself. She is your immortality. She is the means by which you exert your territorial rights, and your territorial rights are the entire universe. Yes. You can't do that with the female of a made man. The white man is not original. He is made. He is not from the mind of the creator. He is from the loins of the black man. One of our black scientists went in a laboratory and extracted from the original a germ. Now, oh, I don't believe that. Will you believe in cloning? That's all it is. Grafted. Their language is grafted. Look in the dictionary. Look in the American dictionary. Every word in it is rooted in another word. Now go in the Arabic dictionary. There's, there's no root word for any Arabic word because Arabic is the root of all language. Those people we call Arabs, they're not the owners of Arabic. You are. That's right. They're the product of mixing with Europeans. That's what this whole continent is now, a hybrid of race mixing. 
It is one thing to interact with other people, it's another thing to mix with other people. You don't see zebras and hyenas making babies. We have no right to upset the balance of creation. So I can do business with you, I can sit down with you, but I don't want my daughter and your son marrying. If you're European, I don't want that. Does that make me a racist? No, that means I accept my own and I'm being myself. That's all it means. Now, Thomas Jefferson, one of the greatest of the founding fathers, because we say the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is a hater, Farrakhan, he's a hater. They hate, they hate white people. Because they want to separate. Because I don't want to I don't want to live next to you and you're beating me to death. So I'm a hater. Okay. But since we love what they say and take what they say as truth, let's hear what Thomas Jefferson has to say about separation. These are his notes from, and you can go to the University of Chicago Library and go to their website and just pull this up, Google it. It's, it's the chapter 15 of a very lengthy writing. Uh, Jefferson was a prolific writer. He was also a statutory rapist. How many, how many white people you know named Jefferson? whose last name is Jefferson? Not many. How many black people named Jefferson? <laughs> Jackson, Johnson, Adams, Washington. Think about it. Now look, he writes here because he is, in his weak mind, he's doing his best to try to save us because he knows that the institution of slavery and the slave trade are condemning America to destruction. So this is in 1784. We've been here a little over 200 years at this time. We came in 1555. We had been in the Caribbean and the Western Hemisphere even prior to that. But we came to these shores 1555. Now the school books say 1619. Jamestown. Jamestown was the first a settlement they were able to sustain. That's right. That's great. Okay, not the first one they ever had. Now, here's Jefferson. To emancipate all slaves born after passing this act. This bill does not itself contain this proposition, but an amendment to it. Now, here's where he, he gives you the content of this law that he's trying to get passed. He says, they should continue to their parents to a certain age, then be brought up at the public expense to tillage, which is agriculture, arts or sciences, according to their geniuses, till the females are 18 and the males 21 years of age, when they should be colonized to such place as the circumstances of the time should render most proper, sending them out, he's talking about the slave population, with arms, implements of household, handicraft arts, seeds, pairs of useful domestic animals, and declare them a free and independent people and extend to them our alliance and protection till they have acquired strength. We, of course, know that bill did not pass. He writes here, and if someone could get me the final call, please, I want to read number four of the Muslim program because there are those of our people that think something's wrong with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, thank you, sir, for 
the Muslim program. Now this is Jefferson in 1784. Now look at this. He says some will ask, well why not just retain and incorporate the blacks into the state and save the expense of supplying, now listen at this, supplying by importation of white settlers the vacancies they'll leave. So the plan was to bring in as many white people as black people are being sent out. Now, look at this. Here's, here's Jefferson answering the opponents who, why, why are we gonna spend all this money? giving black people and giving them arms and food. Now, we put in 200 years by now. Now look at what his answer is. Deep-rooted prejudice entertained by whites. 10,000 recollections by blacks of the injuries they have sustained. So he's going into the mindset of each of the two people. White people with their deep-seated prejudice toward us, and our memory, which no matter how much we try to escape it, of their injuries to us is always there. Then he goes on to say, new provocations, like when a white cop shoots a black teenager in the street. See, it never stops. There's always a fresh experience yes. to show the futility of these two people trying to merge. Outside of Kim Kardashian and Kanye West, a couple of others, and even that's in turmoil, this doesn't work. Now, he goes on to say, many circumstances will divide us into parties and produce convulsions, which will never end but in the extermination of one or the other race. Let's say that again. He says this ain't going nowhere except the extermination of one or the other race. And I'm not even gonna, we don't even have time, but I don't even feel like the psychological effects because it enrages me. When I go on to read, he breaks down the inherent inferiority of black people. He talks about black people having a disagreeable odor. Okay, we're picking cotton. <laughs> and tobacco all day without a bar of soap, you're bathing and your smell makes us want to barf, all right? What is your excuse? This is natural to you. But that's what he's got in here. He talks about the differences of color. He talks about how we are inferior in appearance and intellect, but you're the one that kidnapped a young female slave under age and took her into your house and made oodles of children. And you and other wealthy white slave owners came together to push for legislation. Check this out, beloved. Wait for it. They wanted to pass a law allowing interracial marriage. And you know who the proponents were? Old white men chasing all those beautiful young black females. And we want to let them make us believe that the white man that the black man, first of all, wants a white woman, not in his right mind, he doesn't. Let me tell you, the white man is the one lusting after 
the black woman and the white woman is lusting after the black male. She throws herself at him. So when you see a white woman and a black man, because I know you see him in Charlotte. I've seen them already. They're everywhere. Don't let them sell you that, oh, that brother is with that white girl because he doesn't want a black woman. All right? No. The white girl is with the brother because she doesn't want a white man. Now think about it. The white man got all the power, all the money, but his woman want to be with Tyrone. Think about it. He can't even, she's got to buy him a cell phone. We know this. We know she pays for everything. So he's trying to do an Alice in Wonderland. No, and the brothers will tell you, these white women literally fling themselves. They don't wear any clothes, okay? We are imitating that. You know, far kind of talking about I got put, yeah. I got to wear some clothes, and why can't I say? You can, you can. The question is how much love and self-respect do you have for yourself that any predator crawling out of a rock can feast his eyes upon what you have? Why should he? Why am I sitting up in an architectural firm discussing building plans and my breasts in the man's face. You tell me what, you explain that to me. I don't have to explain to you why I have clothes on. Civilized people wear clothes. And he says things like the blacks uh, require less sleep. (laughs) A black He says, after a long uh, day of labor, will be induced by the slightest amusement to sit up till midnight, knowing he must be out with the first dawn of morning. This is a a psychopath. Look at these darkies. It's amazing. You know, they, they come out of the cotton field and they dance and they sing. How about the fact that after endless hours of back-breaking work, where there's no conversation. See, we're called illiterate and uneducated, but what child can learn to talk if there's no one to talk to? You're not allowed to speak. So when you finally get off the field, I don't care if it's 3 a.m., you gotta do a little something, you know, to loosen up. The very things he cites that make us inferior is what makes us superior. Because no other people could have survived what we have been subjected to. And that, beloved, is the current mindset of white America. You can't show me a point in history where they turned away from that. That's the point. And if you can, show it to me. Was it, was it at the end of chattel slavery? Oh, you mean when Jim Crow went into effect? Was it in the 1920s and 30s, 40s, and 50s? The brothers and sisters took us to the museum the other day, yesterday, and we saw the evolution of moving from slavery to sharecropper the discrimination, fighting about going to school, fighting about drinking out of a water fountain. It goes on and on, and it has not stopped to this day. You can't be black and be a quarterback in the NFL without all hell breaking loose. Cam Newton, oh my God, he said he's black. He had the audacity to say to them, you've never seen anything like me. You hear what this nigga said? (laughs) (laughs) And what makes it so 
appalling is not that he said it, but that is true. You haven't seen anything like him. And now the NFL, you know, when we get in something, we take it to the next level. So now you got Russell Wilson, you got Cam Newton, you got the brother down in Florida. Now is the era of the black quarterback. So we're moving into a time when you will not win a championship. Now this is a nightmare to them because the quarterback is the intellect. He's the center of the team. This can't be. The U.S. gymnastic women's team. Once Gabrielle got up in there, it was over lights out. Now you got this little girl, Simone, who can jump up higher than this building and flow through the air and come down, as they say, a perfect landing. Yeah, none, of, none of these stumbles. Then right behind them is the Latino sister. So three of the five members of the U.S. Olympic team this year in Brazil, two sisters and a Latino. And when they called them out, the two little white girls that made it, they were like, oh, thank you. Oh, God. Oh, my God. I've been working on this since I was in the womb. I <laughs> and then these Negroes, they just, it's like they just fly. <laughs> Because we're gods, that's why. All praise is due to Allah. So I'm gonna quickly go to um, the course and just lift an excerpt from it. The course, this monumental course called Self-Improvement, the Basis for Community Development, which allows us as individuals to spend time on self-care. Yes. Because we're so busy taking care of other people, right. we don't take care of ourselves. And this is one of the reasons for the violence in the black community. Remember I said from the Quran, there is life for you in retaliation. You know, when someone um, harms you, there has to be a response to that. Right. Yes. Okay? Yes. It, it has nothing to do with love. Oh, we got to love everybody. God has yeah. never loved everybody. Right. You better read that Bible again. Look what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah. Go find where Sodom and Gomorrah was. God said, when I get through with you, it will be as though you never were. Okay? The most, the biggest terrorist in the universe is God. Okay, because when, when one of those tornadoes, when, when he spins that air, and one of those tornadoes comes at you and turns your house into toothpicks, and you see these white people out there crying because they moved out somewhere to get away from us, and now they're in what's called Tornado Alley. I mean, don't they realize in those open fields? <laughs> That's where that wind can spin, you know, and break dance and do its thing, all right? Well, when your house is a splinter behind you, that's not ISIS. That ain't Al-Qaeda. That's not Tyrone. It's not Farrakhan, all right? Who, who are you gonna call now to deal with that? That is the creator. So if he, and he'll take out babies. See, when it comes time to remove a people, he gives no value to age, gender. He's an equal opportunity destroyer. Okay, everybody who's in that area has got to go. And that's why we better get in a separate state or territory of our own. Now, the back of the Final Call newspaper, every issue, is the Muslim program, which the Honorable Elijah Muhammad published in 1965 in response to questions from whites and blacks alike. What do y'all want? What do the Muslims want? And he answered it with the Muslim program. And I want you to keep in mind, as I quickly go over this, one of the founders of America, the United States of America. And what he said 
should be done to solve the problem of the slaves because they knew the institution of slavery was unsustainable. So after 200 years, the land had been cleared, the country was habitable, we had laid out, designed, and built Washington, D.C. Yes. We built their mansions in the South and their office buildings in the North. We taught them etiquette and dining, sitting at a table, use a utensil, tablecloths. We made draperies, windows with glass in them. We introduced them to all of that. These are people that just prior to that were barking at the moon on all four legs. Now, that's what they tell you. They admit that. So Jefferson felt we should be released with substance. He was following the book of Genesis. He wanted to get us out before God came in. All right. They read the Bible, too, because they gave it to us. Now, what is it that the Muslims want? We want freedom. Go ahead. We want a full and complete freedom. That's number one. That's right. Number two, we want justice. Equal justice under the law. We want justice applied equally to all regardless of creed or class or color. Now where's the racism in that? It's not there. Number three, we want equality of opportunity. We want equal membership in society with the best in civilized society. Now, would someone please tell me which one of those three things we have been given? Okay. I, right. I, we haven't gotten this. We're still fighting over the Voting Rights Act. Let's get real. Okay. So, with none of those things materializing, in almost 500 years, half a millennium, we need to go to number four. There's a point we have to move on. Number four, we want our people in America whose parents or grandparents were descendants from slaves to be allowed to establish a separate state or territory of their own, either on this continent or elsewhere. Now, where's the hate in that statement? When a married couple is throwing stuff at each other, throwing knives, cussing, breaking dishes, the suitable answer is for somebody to leave. That's right. That's right. Contrary to what we're being fed, separation is not hate. Separation is a peaceful solution. In fact, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said it is the best and only solution. So even if it's not the best one, it's the only one. Because we've tried everything else. Now, he goes on. We believe. Now, that first part, is that right with Jefferson? Isn't that what Jefferson said? Pack them up. Pack them up. Okay. Let them go. He said a colony. We say a state or territory of our own. Okay. And he said that at the end of his, Jefferson, that they should be recognized as an independent state. Yes. They should have arms. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad goes on, we believe that our former slave masters are obligated to provide such land and that the area must be fertile and minerally rich. Yes. Yes. We believe that our former slave masters are obligated to maintain and supply our needs in this separate territory for the next 20 to 25 years until we are able to produce and supply our own needs. What's wrong with that? What did we get in 1865? Nothing. 
People talk about the 40 acres and a mule. That was General Sherman of the Union Army. He promised that to the slaves, particularly those that enlisted and helped. But in 1877, in a compromise, the North withdrew all of the federal troops from the South. And that's when the few brothers had been elect, who had been elected, I think it was a George Smith, uh, from right here in North Carolina, was the last representative to Congress from that era. And North Carolina passed a law to make it impossible for anyone black to be elected to the legislature. All the southern states did, and the North allowed it. And then he says, finally, this is all number four, since we cannot get along with them in peace and equality. After giving them 400 years of our sweat and blood and receiving in return some of the worst treatment human beings have ever experienced, we believe our contributions to this land and the suffering forced upon us by white America justifies our demand for complete separation in a state or territory of our own. Now where is that hate? Where is that irrational? Where is that wrong? That is nothing but the closest thing we could ever get to justice yes. in return. Now, in the Holy Quran, it reads, Seest thou not that Allah sends down water from the clouds? Then we bring forth therewith fruits of various hues, and in the mountains are streaks, white and red, of various hues, and others intensely black. And of men, and beasts, and cattle, there are various colors likewise. Those of his servants only who are possessed of knowledge fear Allah. Surely Allah is mighty forgiving. See, only if we're possessed of knowledge do we fear Allah. If we're not, we fear his enemy. Now why? Uh, Sister Ava, why are you calling the white man God's enemy? Because he is in opposition to God's will. That's what an enemy is, who stands in complete opposition to everything you are thinking, saying, and doing, and is poised to prevent you. Well, what Allah has done is create a planet, a solar system, a universe, right. where there's more than enough abundance yeah. for all living creatures to flourish and enjoy their time on this planet. Yeah. You have a people who have determined that they are going to go from one country to the next and invade, kill the men, rape the women, take the natural resources of those countries, and if you do not submit to their way, they eliminate you. Yeah. And that's their history. Tell me something different. You can't. You can't tell me anything different. Now, in study guide uh, number 12, and, and I promise you I'm closing with this. <laughs> Praise is due to Allah. Because I want to just talk briefly about perception and attitudes. In the nation of Islam, we are taught to accept your own and be yourself. Now, if you decide to be you, what happens if someone comes along and wants to make you them? What do you do? Do you bow to that? Or do you stand up for what your own self is? You know, the US Constitution guarantees right of the free exercise of religion, right of free speech, and also freedom of assembly. 
to seek redress of grievances. When Black Lives Matters sponsors protests to address the grievances of our community for the wanton murders of innocent black people. And even if you just count, because this is only a tip of the iceberg, let's just go back to 2012, which is only six years ago, four years ago, four years ago, to Trayvon Martin, 17 years old, high school, halftime of a game, going to a convenience store to get some Skittles. He's in his father's house, okay? Because of uh, another individual's perception of Trayvon, he subjects Trayvon to a very terrifying and violent death, okay? Now, Trayvon's crime was being black and male. That's it, there is no more, okay? And we can, and young. And even when we run through the list, let's look at Eric Garner in New York. Father, husband, we know black people can't get work because it's not free anymore. Donald Trump thinks $15 an hour is too much money to pay an individual. And many white people who are on, on welfare themselves agree with him. All right? So Eric Garner, being a black man who's a man, okay, does what he can to supply for his family. So he's on the sidewalk. Everybody knows him. But these are a people that are known in the Bible as beasts. In human Form. You better deal with it. You better leave alone all of these little lessons in, put your hands on the dashboard, turn the lights on, say yes, officer, no, officer. That's what Philando Castile was doing. When he was shot to death in front of his woman and his four year old baby. Here's a uh, Alton Sterling laying flat on the ground, stretched out with this big fat cops on him. He couldn't move. He takes out the gun and shoots him to death. You got a mental health worker who's trying to calm down a patient. The patient's holding a toy truck. A blind man can see it's a toy truck. Police come up. The brother, knowing in the wake of all these killings, trying not to get killed, he's laying on the ground, completely stretched out, arms up in the air, officer, officer, I'm unarmed. Bang! Now here's the coup de grace. He asked the officer later, officer, why did you shoot me? Answer, I don't know. I don't know. Now that's enough for us to pack up and get out of Dodge, okay? Seriously. Okay? Because what he was doing was confirming and bearing witness to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who we call a hate teacher, some of us, but who taught us that the nature of the Caucasian is lying, stealing, murdering, not only the black man, but each other. See, he said, I don't know, because the urge in him to kill you doesn't emanate from the intellect. See, he was asked a question of his intellect, his reasoning, the word why can only be answered through reasoning. 
He said, I don't know because it didn't come from his intellect. It came from his survival mechanism. When he sees black skin, when he sees melanin, particularly the male, then that arouses in him fear. This is why they always say, I thought he had a gun. Now, our late beloved sister, who I was so blessed to have her on my radio show, Dr. Frances Cress Welsing. All praise due to a lot. Brilliant, bold black woman. She identified it through their science of psychiatry, the condition that these people suffer from. And they're born with it. It's genetic. It is called fear of genetic annihilation. Okay? Why does he think you, black men, are armed? It's not the gun he's seeing. It is your reproductive power. It is your natural position as the possessor of the seed from which all life comes. So that if you get with his woman, you're going to subsume him. Now, somebody called in, sisters, to my show while Dr. Wesley was on there. And they said, well, Dr. Wesley, I'm following you, I think, but can you give me an example of genetic annihilation? You said white people fear that. I think I know what you're saying, but I'm not sure. She said, I'm going to give you a real clear illustration of genetic annihilation. She said, Barack Obama is genetic annihilation. A black man from Kenya had intercourse with a white girl from Kansas. What came out was a black child. It's genetic annihilation. That's it. The reason the Caucasian people, the male in particular, had such a vehement reaction to President Obama's election, let me tell you, they wouldn't have acted like that if it was Colin Powell. I'm going to tell you, they wouldn't. They, they wouldn't like it. But Barack Hussein Obama sent them over the edge of sanity for many reasons. Number one, he is genetic annihilation. He's what you get when black mixes with white. You get black. That's what you get. Secondly, no matter how sweet, nice, kind, can't we all get along, he is. Somewhere in him, the most important decision, brother, you ever make in your life is your selection of a mate. That's right. More important than a house, car, where you're going to live, what team you're going to root for, none of that matters. Who you select, mate selection. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a threat to y'all. He married a black woman from the south side of Chicago. Genuine, <laughs> thoroughbred, 100% black woman. He doesn't have the slave experience but Michelle does. And on top of that, she's black, she's gorgeous, she's a lawyer, and had she not been by his side, he never would have survived this experience. But every night he went home to Michelle. 
And some nights she wrapped her arms around him, and other nights she cussed him out. But at all times, she had his back. And they know it, and we know it. And if that's not, and then they have these little black children. I used to love seeing them get off Air Force One. And they would have that little black child hair. <laughs> black dog, two of them. Okay. <laughs> in the White House. Now, but to make it worse, to nail in the coffin, his daddy is Kenyan. And his father was from the tribe of Kenyans that ran the British out of Kenya. They call him Mau Mau tribe. That's who he's from. So he is genetic annihilation. And this is why Donald Trump was able to climb to be the nominee because all they want is a white male. They want the whitest male that they can find. And Donald Trump is the closest thing to how white people looked when they first came out of the caves. Okay. No melanin whatsoever. Okay. And that's why he looks like he does. He, his hair is like an orangutan and his that white around his eyes, that's the goggles you put on when you go in the tanning machine. And he comes out red. He's incapable of acquiring color. So here's Minister Farrakhan's words. This is the Quran first leading into it. Nay, we hurl truth against falsehood. So it knocks out its brains and lo, it vanishes. By changing laws, he writes, we do not affect conditions because changing a law does not change attitudes or systems of belief. Pharaoh feared that Moses would change the religion, which means he feared the drastic altering of the belief system which the world was built upon. Stop. This is why they fear Islam. Not Islam for terrorism, because they're the biggest terrorists on earth. What they fear is the changing of the mind of their former slaves. Now, frankly, as Minister Farrakhan told Howard University students years ago, Islam feeds the warlike propensities of the black man. It's not the nature of the black man to lie down and take crap off nobody. It's not. The only way you can make that happen is through her. You kidnap her, you rape her, you plant your seed in her womb. And you have those babies nurse her fear of her captor from her breast. And after three generations, you no longer have a black people. You have a hybrid people called the so-called Negro. That is why we engage in the most unnatural kind of behavior. How on God's earth do you let a white boy come up in a Bible study in church, gun down nine people and you in court talking about we forgive? First of all, to get forgiveness, you need to be sorry. What are you talking about? I am not teaching my children, my husband and I are not teaching our grandson to forgive. You murdering us. God will not forgive and we will not forget. It ain't happening. Now those of you that want to go down with them, go on. I'm done.
done. I'm, I'm done. I am. I am. I'm done. In the most holy name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, we give praise and thanks to Allah for his love and mercy upon humanity.